let's reason together about how we can do the most good. And Max mentioned I'm the president of Adventure Insights, so which is an organization devoted to promoting rational thinking, including about how we do the most good. Kind of that's a combination of being pulled with our heart to do the most good while applying our mind to making that decision. You know, I often meet people who talk about they really want to do good, they really care about the world, they really want to impact it in the best way possible, but they just don't know how. They are confused, they're not sure, they have a difficult time deciding what is the thing that they can do, what is the difference that they can make in the world. And this will be a presentation about that. What is the difference that you can make in the world? How can you do it most effectively? How can you make the most positive impact in the world that you can? That's what we're going to be talking about today. So, the things to do, of course, when we talk about doing good, in general, folks want to decrease suffering and increase flourishing. Those are the kind of things that when we talk about, let's dig deeper into doing good. What does it mean to do good? We want to decrease suffering. You know, we don't want people or animals to suffer, and we want to increase flourish, increase well-being. Now, there are two concepts to be familiar with when we talk about those things. There's utilitarianism, which is doing the most good for the most number. And there's negative utilitarianism, which is focusing on reducing the most suffering. So that's kind of a basic division when you start to think about what kind of difference do you want to make. Do you care more about doing the most good, or do you care most about reducing suffering and then doing good? And different people fall into different camps based on their own values. And that's a question you have to ask yourselves. Where do you fall? You know, if you want to do the most good, there might be times when you would increase happiness at the cost of the increasing suffering. And that's something you have to think about. That's not some, a question I can answer for you. But that's a question that you want to be thinking about. Where can you do the most good? Now, my personal answer, this is not you know, to bias you in any way, I personally lean toward the negative utilitarianism aspect of it. I want to decrease suffering more than de increase well-being. And it's a trade-off, of course, for me. Like, it's not ultimate. But I generally feel that decreasing suffering is more important than increasing flourishing. That's, again, my take on things. So yeah, that's a question you have to answer for yourselves. So it's just the first concept I want to familiarize you with. Now, going onward, we need to think about how we give and why we give, why we want to make a difference in the world. So often, the reason people give is because of stories. They give their time, their energy, their attention because of storms, because of motions. They're pulled to do things. They really give from their heart. So, for example, here's a dying child, Albe, who wished to be a pirate hunter. That's kind of his wish. He really, really wanted to be a pirate hunter. And he, you know, you, you have this story where he's a child, he's dying, his wish fulfillment, great story kind of really pulling you in. You really want to help him fulfill his wish of being a pirate hunter. And that's really, you can see the wonderful thing that would be if, you know, hey, this dying child, he gets to be a pirate hunter for a day. Isn't that great? Like, you know, what a wonderful story. So that's like a story that really pulls our heartstrings and really pushes us to do the good for that child. It's really powerful. Now, let's compare that story to another story. Make-A-Wish Foundation, which fulfilled Al Bay's wishes of being a pirate for a day, spends about 50000 on, on one wish. You know, making somebody a pirate for a day, fighter pilot for a day, cop for a day, Disney princess for a day. Let's compare that to another story. Against Malaria Foundation saves a life for under $3,000. So you get $3,000, $50,000. That's, you know, a difference of 17 times. So you have 17 children, you save them from death. You have children, they're dying. There's wish fulfillment, no great story. You don't get a great story from saving a child from death, from against the Larry Foundation. You don't get to hear the, ch the story of a child who is saved from death. You don't get to hear that, but that's a child who is not dead. That's 17 children who are not dead. That's 17 lifetimes of stories. 
but we don't hear those stories. We don't think about those stories. But what makes the bigger impact? So that's so the fundamental that gets to the fundamental brokenness of how we respond to stories, how we respond to emotions, how our brain works. So Max mentioned in the beginning that this is Columbus rationality. And we're here to talk about the rationality, how our mind works. And our mind is broken, flawed, in fundamental ways that cause us to make bad decisions about how we get. And the example I just shared with you of the story-driven giving is a fundamental example of how our mind is flawed at making decisions about where to give. Because the Make-A-Wish Foundation, by comparison, when it shares its stories, gets much more money than against Malaria Foundation. Although it's such a, makes a much bigger, more positive impact on the world to save 17 children from, and give them a lifetime of stories rather than one child, one story, one day. So that's, you know, the aspect of rationality, what we're here to think about. How do we make the most good in the most powerful way? So, and that's called the narrative fallacy. That's called the narrative fallacy. So only 3% of research, on the, only 3% of people do research on the effectiveness of charities before donating. The vast majority of people give because they hear stories, they hear, they have personal appeals for some sort of reason that's not about effectiveness. They don't look at the effectiveness of a charity, they don't look at the effectiveness of the cause that they do in the world. You know, I heard, I was talking to folks here about, uh, about training that they went to, discovering how their purpose matches what they want to do in the world, the good they want to do in the world. It's kind of a question of how you connect that good that you want to do in the world with the effectiveness of your actions. And so you need to avoid falling for the narrative fallacy that motivates our giving. And avoiding falling for those stories, avoiding falling for that narrative fallacy. And use the scientific method. Applying the scientific method of thinking to charity. So, let's talk about how do we quantify the good that we do in the world? How can we map it? Also known as nerding out and doing good. <laughs> so, how do we quantify the good that we can actually do? How do we apply the scientific method? We think in terms of quality adjusted life years. That's the fundamental metric of how we can do good for people, for animals, whatever cause you care about. Quality adjusted life years. Both quality and quantity of life lived, where one quality equals one year in perfect health. So, for example, someone, who, it's typically, a typical example is someone who is blind. Someone who is blind, it's considered, you know, a year of blind life is considered half a quality. Because that, that's an, an example of an impairment. You can, you can imagine someone who is, like, say, has a cold for a year, hypothetically. That's, you know, maybe... 8.8 .8 qualities or something like that. So that's an impairment of a quality based on sickness. And of course, you know, death is the ultimate end of qualities. So quality adjusted life here is how we measure well-being. And here is an example. Uh, I gave this graph as an example of qualities. So you could see no intervention minus 40 qualities. Intervention one, the one, on the black one on the top, it someone without that intervention would have been sick, would have been sicker, and that intervention gave them plus 10 qualities. The intervention 2, that's uh, not about the quality of life, but life expectancy, increased somebody's life, actually. So that's the kind of ways of thinking when we measure qualities. You can save and extend somebody's life, you can make somebody healthier. So that's one measure, quality. That's the measure of impact. Now, the other measure is quantifying effectiveness. So we do even more nerding out and doing good. So you have quality, you have effectiveness. You have limited resources. We, we all live in a world with limited resources. It sucks. <laughs> you know, it's reality. Well, that's what we have to think about. So you need to choose the most 
cost-effective interventions, and to do so, you divide the qualities by the cost to get the most cost-effective intervention. For example, let's say you have an intervention that saves five qualities. Let's say it saves five years of somebody's life in good health, or, you know, prevents somebody from having blindness for ten years. The same thing would be either five qualities of just life, healthy, fully healthy life, or ten years without blindness. That's five qualities. And then you have an intervention, how much does it cost? You have, let's say, $100 for either of those interventions. So you divide five qualities by $100. So you have that intervention costs $20 per quality. So $20 per life saved. And so on. And that's how you measure any sort of intervention that you do. So that is the fundamental basis of how you can actually quantify doing good in the world. And again, this applies to human beings, this applies to animals. You know, you can save an animal's life, uh, and you can quantify the qualities of that. You can save a human being's life, and you can quantify the qualities of that, and how much each intervention costs. That's the fundamental measure of cost-effectiveness. So if you're pulled to do good in the world, you want to quantify the quality of that. So for let's go to the example we used in the beginning. You know, make a wish foundation. That's one good feeling for a child for a day. That's a very small quality. Versus the 17 children, you know, save their lives for the same amount of money. That's a huge amount of qualities. For the same amount of money. So, tiny quality, lots of qualities, same amount of money. So then we can clearly see the quantification, where the quantification of the quality, the impact, and the cost effectiveness gets us. If we could really truly measure the amount of good that we do in the world through this very simple metric. Let's go on. Effective altruism is a movement that's devoted to applying the scientific method to charity. And quantifying qualities and measuring cost-effectiveness is the fundamental ways it does so. So there's a movement, that's what it does, and it's a relatively new movement, it's about a decade old. It came about because of the brokenness of the nonprofit sector and the orientation towards stories, and it's the effort to apply data, the effort to apply rational thinking to our giving of time and resources and energy of our hearts to improving the world. That's what the effective altruism movement is oriented towards. And it includes a number of things that you might care about. So there are three broad beneficiary groups within the effective altruism sector. You have people. And here, where the when the movement talks about people, it talks about all people around the world, regardless of geography, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of ideological identification, value systems. So, it treats all people equally. Now, that doesn't mean that you need to treat all people equally. But that's the ideology, that's the perspective of the movement, that all people should be equal. So, when you hear the reports of quantification of qualities, that's the way it treats everything. So, it's a question for you to answer. Do you treat all people equally? Do you think about all people equally? Then, animals. Your animals or all animals? So again, you know, do you consider cats to be as important as chickens, to be as important as pigs, and so on? The movement, effective altruism movement, considers all animals to be equal in that respect. So that's how it measures qualities, and uh, that's where its recommendations come from. So that doesn't mean that that's something you need to do, but that's just the recommendations of the movement, and that's when you hear it talking about animals, that's how it measures this element. And then future beings. How much do you care about the well-being of future beings? There's an argument to be made that, you know, there will be lots of people living in the future, lots of animals living in the future. How do you compare the welfare of current beings versus how do you compare the welfare of future beings? That will impact whether you put your donations into, let's say, saving current people from malaria, or addressing environmental disasters in the future. So that is the kind of question <coughs> that you need to think about when making donations. So this is where this is how the broad categories of beneficiary groups of the movement 
are divided. And again, this is they're trying. This is a movement that's trying to apply the most rational thinking to the doing good in the world. That's why it's trying to apply it, trying to divide it into comprehensible categories. That's in accordance with different people's value sets. So let's look, talk a little bit about the organizations within the movement that do things that you might want to check out. So these are called meta charities. They're organizations that address the charity sector and that try to intervene in it in a positive way. So current human beings. You have an organization called GiveWell.org, which offers in-depth reports and rankings of global poverty. You have an organization called The Life You Can Save, which offers an impact calculator for global poverty, as well as rankings of global poverty organizations. I'll have this uh, slide up on SlideShare and the link to it, so you don't have to take notes uh, right now if you don't wish to. But you'll have this information available later, or you can email me about it as well. And you have Giving What We Can, which is a, which is a community of people who pledge 10% of their money to address global poverty issues, mainly global poverty issues, some others as well, but 10% of their money to effective charity. So it unites a community of people who do that. So th these organizations are focused on current human beings. So that's who you care about. These are organizations that are wise to think about. You have current non-human beings. You have animal charity evaluators, which offers in-depth reports, rankings, and advocacy for animal charities. And you have sentient politics, which does various forms of animal advocacy as well. You have future beings and existential risk. So that's the third category. The Future of Humanity Institute, research on various existential risks. You have the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, which does research on artificial intelligence risk. So these are two organizations that are focused more on far future risk. There are two organizations that are focused on near and medium term risk. That's CIFAR, Center for Advanced Rationality, Applied Rationality, I'm sorry, Spreading Rationality to Social Elites. So uh, spreading rationality as a means of addressing existential risk issues. And Tensional Insights, which is the organization that I'm part of, which does this for a broad audience. So spreading rational thinking to a broad audience as a way of addressing existential risk and helping improve rational thinking and you know, trying to make sure the world go doesn't go to hell in a hell in a um, basket. And you have organizations within the movement that are oriented toward building up the movement within the effective altruism movement. So you have the Center for Effective Altruism, you have Impact, and you have the Effective Altruism Foundation. They unite a variety of projects, which I don't go into in depth. We can go into in depth in the question and answer. You have 80,000 hours, which recommends the most high impact careers. So for those of you who are thinking about your career orientation, that's a good website to go to to think about what careers you want to pursue for to make the most impact. Local Effective Altruism Network supports local EA groups around the world. Students for High Impact Charity spreads EA ideas to high schools and college students, mostly high schools. And again, Intentional Insights spreads the ideas to broad audiences, oh, like this presentation right here. This is what one of the things that Intentional Insights does. So to sum up, this is the promise of a better tomorrow, maximizing global flourishing and reducing suffering through applying the scientific method to charity. This is what can be accomplished through this approach, through avoiding the narrative fallacy, through applying the scientific method, through quantifying qualities, the impact we make, and through measuring the cost effectiveness, and through evaluating how much qualities we can get for each intervention, for each thing we do in the world. So now that you know, what will you do? How will this knowledge change your actions? And so what step will you take, if any, to support the project of making a better tomorrow through EA methods and through other methods? That's something I want to discuss. One great approach, I'd suggest, is spreading ea themed ideas, now that you know. So convincing one other person who would do as much good in the world in a lifetime as you is the same as the good you would do in the world. So this is a reason why, major reason why we found the intentional insights, because convincing other people to do good 
is going to be a wonderful impact that you can have in the world and encouraging them to think about what are the most effective ways they could do good, what are the most cost-effective ways, or what are the most impactful ways is a wonderful way that you can make a difference. So if you're interested, you can talk to me about it, and I'll be glad to help you out with that. And that's what I want to talk about. So the PowerPoint of this presentation, as I, as I mentioned, on slideshare.net at Intentional Insights, and you can get in touch with me at club at intentionalinsights.org. And I hope knowing this information, you will help make a better tomorrow. Thank you.